Ramanujan Fuji is now available on the Google Play Store. Try it out for free. Uh, welcome students. So today is, uh, we are continuing with magnetostatics and today I'm not going to too much go back, uh, you know, back in history, you know, sometimes you must follow with the Ramayana as it goes on, you know, so very important. <laughs> so last time we ended with this, let me put it in. So last time we ended with looking at the torque on a current carrying loop placed in a magnetic field. Okay. So now if there is a loop, you know, a square loop, rectangular loop, not square, rectangular loop of side A and B, right, uh, is placed in a magnetic field B. Okay. So it is a loop carrying current which is placed in a magnetic field, right. So what is the law that applies uh, with respect to a single loop? Uh, uh, you know, let's say you have you break up the loop into four lines, right? Each of the lines of the loop is a current carrying wire, right? So if you look at that, right, which is the law that applies I times L cross B, okay? So we will apply I times L cross B four times, okay? But so. Each of the I times L cross B when you apply, right? So force, so let us look at one, two, three, four, right? One, right? Two, three, four. And the red is the B, okay? So in the case of one, right? The B and the L are in the same direction. L cross B is zero. Okay. Um, for if, if, but then see right now when the loop is like this, there is an angle, right? So if it is flat like this and the B is like this, L cross B will be zero, right? But then they've kept it at an angle, you know? And so because it's at an angle, right, the B is flat, the, um, the wire, the, the plane of the, of the loop is at an angle. So you do have a, uh, uh, you know, a corresponding um, uh, 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 field. Otherwise, the other thing you can do is you can move the B to be at an angle while the loop is flat. Okay. In this case, that's what they have done. They have kept the B at an angle to the Z. Z is, so X and Y is the plane of the, X and Y is the plane of the rectangular loop. The loop is in the X, Y plane, like that, okay? Now the B is at an angle of phi from the Z axis, okay? So it is at an angle phi from the Z. So if that is Z, it is at an angle phi from the Z. So that is B. So now, how do you, uh, you know, measure the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the B, right? There is a B that is upwards, B cos phi, right? And there is a B along the, uh, um, uh, uh, along the, uh, XY plane, right? And that B, he is writing it as B sine phi J. Okay. So he has this, uh, 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 this uh, B in, in, in this form. Okay. So now for F1, right? For F1, you have the two components with J and I and the uh, current the current is entirely along I, right? This is the direction of X. The current is along I and this is, has a J component and a K component. So I cross J and then I cross K. I cross J is K, right? I cross K is 
minus j. Okay, i cross j is k, and i cross k is minus j. Okay, so i times l cross b, l is what? L is the length b. Okay, so for for force on one, l is b times i. In the case of two, it is a times j. Right? See, two it is a times j. For three, it is going to be minus b times i. Right? And for four, it is going to be minus a times j. You see, minus a times j for four, minus b times i for three, and a times j for Right, so you must think little bit, learn to understand little bit what is happening between three dimensions. Okay, so uh, he is just repeatedly applying i times l cross b, i times l cross b, i times l cross b, i times l cross b. Okay, and when he repeatedly applies that, he ends up with these f one, f two, f three, and f four. Okay, notice. That f1 is minus f4, f2 is minus f4. That is very obvious, right? This is minus iab cos phi. That is plus iab cos phi, right? Now f1 is also minus f3. Okay. So what can you say? The force on one. Which is going where the current is flowing this way, and the force on two where the current is flowing that way, right? They in fact cancel each other out. Okay, so they are in opposite directions, but they are not at the same point. So, so the net force will produce a rotating effect. Okay, so that is the basic idea. It produces a torque. Okay. So, because the forces are exactly opposite each other, it will cause a torque. The net force is therefore zero, but there is a torque due to F1 about O because it is held in uh, in a particular axis, right? It will be made to rotate. Okay. So, a rectangular loop placed in a beam will be Placed in a uh, uniform field, and you know will be rotating and and uh, mounted about an axis will rotate. Okay, and so that is the basic idea there. Okay, so the total there is a there is no force, but there is a total torque. The total torque is given by a b times a. You notice b times a that is the area. Right, b a times b is the area of the loop. The area of the loop times the b times the i times sine phi by two. Okay, so now if it was perpendicular, sine phi will be ninety. Right, if z is that way, right? If it is a full ninety degrees, right? You will end up with sine ninety. Sin ninety is one, right? So b times i times area is the torque. Okay, so torque is tau one plus tau three, right? So tau one plus tau three will produce a torque. Tau two and tau four will cancel. Okay, it will be zero. So tau one plus tau three will produce b times a, where a is the area times the This is b. The the two will will this one by two and this one by two will will be additive. Therefore, it will become a one. Okay? Half plus half is one. Therefore, you have b times a times i. Okay, so that is the total torque. Okay, now the the there is the, he then goes on to define this term called m. Okay, m is merely the current. I times a is m, a where a is the area. You define the area as a vector, right? And whenever you define areas as a vector in physics, 
the direction you always give is normal to the area itself okay so a is ab times k which is the direction of z because the area is in the plane of x and y and it occupies and its magnitude is ab its direction is perpendicular to the area itself so i times n times i n times a i times a is the magnetic dipole moment and the torque is m cross b okay so the torque is m cross b and is along the the i direction what is the i direction the i direction is this way along x okay the torque is in this direction right and it is therefore going to rotate like this torque is in this direction all right so uh so if you had n such loops n such rectangular loops you multiply it by n okay because there are n such loops which cause the and therefore that n is added to the dipole moment okay so the dipole moment is everything else i times a a times ab ab is the capital a it is the area i times the area times this vector i okay or or not this vector i but actually the vector k okay so now k times uh, cross b will then produce you i which is the torque m cross b is the torque it is very similar to the case of torque in the case of the electric dipole in the case of electric dipole we got p cross b like that this one is m cross b and m is defined to be defined by this formula so that happened in the context of uh force equals eq this happens in the context of i times l cross b okay therefore n is remember what n is i times a and perpendicular to a okay it is along the perpendicular to the area of the loop okay so n times nia is m and that times b okay so that is dipole moment so now i'm going to go to a slightly divergent um but related idea okay because we are going to deal with this idea uh, very often in uh, electricity and magnetism and that is the uh, but it is related to magnetostatics it is called it is this concept called a galvanometer in a galvanometer there is a a a, a coil okay this whole thing is a, a kind of spring okay and then there is this coil okay now when what happens is it will when uh, when you pass a current right see so you see a current this is a battery right so you know this is the positive terminal of the battery this is the negative terminal there are not two batteries only one battery positive terminal negative terminal just a uh, dip friction you know so right coil okay and this rectangular coil is placed in a magnetic field you remember what we did here magnetic field with a rectangular coil exactly same thing okay so you see the n and you see the s that is the magnetic field that is producing the magnetic field so the magnetic field right is placed in this mounted coil uh, the, this mounted coil carrying a current is placed in this magnetic field so what is that coil going to do it is going to twist right so when you pass a current it is going to twist and when it twists right it is going to move the needle okay so 
this need will go from here to here when the current reaches a certain value when the current is less it will go from here to here when it is more it will go from here to here when when it is most it will go from here to here okay so this device is called a moving coil galvanometer okay a moving coil galvanometer is very often used in order to build or at least in the old days you know or even now i think you know it is very often used to build two devices one is called an ammeter and the other is called an voltmeter the ammeter is used to measure amperes yeah you it is a unit of current and the voltmeter is used to measure volt which is a measure of voltage okay so the side the size of the current notice that the m here the size of the current right the torque that it generates is proportional to the current okay more the current more the torque but then there is a catch the catch is that at the maximum it can vary it works only over a small window of current values from 0 to say 100 milliamps okay so at 100 milliamps it has already gone full full the uh, distance after that it cannot go any more so now what you have to do is you have to set it in a parallel circuit and we already went uh, dealt with circuits earlier in the uh, in uh, you know about a month ago right so we set it we introduced what is called a parallel resistor such parallel resistors are called shunts okay so now let's uh, look at the mass of this device okay the mass of this device is like this b times k times phi at equilibrium right the torque is k times phi okay and uh, k times and phi is the angle what is phi phi is the angle okay so the if k times phi is equal to n i a b where a is the area n i is the current n is the number of turns right number of loops of the of the square loops and b is the magnetic field okay so n a b by k will give you the phi times i will nad by k are all constants for a particular galvanometer how many loops is a constant right the area is a constant the b is a constant because this magnet is a fixed set of a pair of magnet right so the only variable is the current passing okay the more the current the more the angle okay so k times phi right k is the is the spring constant i don't know if we if you have heard of this torsional pendulum right we did uh, hooks law uh, s equals kx right that there is in a torsional uh, spring you have tau equals k phi okay a torsional spring okay so k phi is the torque tau equals k phi k phi is caused by the by the torque on the square loop n i a b is the torque on the square loop that causes the twist in the in the spring okay so now when you need to take the galvanometer and make an ammeter right what you need to do is you need to introduce this parallel resistance called the shunt resistor rf here okay so now oh sorry what you want to do is you want to pass let's say you want to calibrate the ammeter to the ammeter goes to full deflection at 1 uh, 1 milliampere but you want to measure you know you are a greedy man you know you say no 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 i but i cannot make a new galvanometer right i want my galvanometer to measure 1 milliamps 100 milliamps uh, you know 10 amps 
different settings should produce different uh, um, uh, measurements, right? These are all designs. People have thought very carefully about these things, how to make these things happen, okay? So in each case, they will introduce a parallel resistor, the parallel shunt, shunt resistor, which is different, okay? If you want the 100 milliamps, you introduce one resistor. If you want 1000 milliamps, which is or one amp, right? So you introduce a different resistor. So what is the resistor you must in introduce? If I is 100 milliamps and the current through RG is 1 milliamp, okay? So these are fixed, right? I is 100 milliamps, right? To convert to an ammeter cable of measuring uh, up to 100 milliamps, this I is 100 milliamps. What is the current to RG? Now, what should RS be? We calculated how this RG is 20 ohms. Okay, RG is 20 ohms. Okay, now RG is 20 ohms. What can RS be so that when I is 100 milliamps, RG is 1 milliamp. The current through RG is 1 milliamp. So how do you calculate that? I equals IS plus RG. IG RG equals IS RS. Right? The voltage across RG is equal to the voltage across RS. Right? So now using these two equations, which are all the, the knowns and which are all the unknowns? IG is known. Right? I is known, IG is 1 milliamp, I is 100 milliamp, so IS is 99, right? So, but, but what you don't know is RS, right? So, this is 99, so 1 times, 1 times RG, which is 20, 1 times 20 equals 99 times RS. Okay, the milli milli will cancel, right? So 1 times 20 equals 99 times RS. What is the value of RS? Okay, so that's how he calculates RS equals 20 times 20 is IG, RG times IG, right? RG times IG divided by 100 minus 1, 10 to the power of minus 3. Okay, 99 times. 10 to the power of minus 3, he ends up with 20 by 99 ohms. Okay, so that is the, uh, how you introduce, how you take a galvanometer and convert it to an ammeter. Okay, now we're going to do an, uh, another one. Okay, now we're going to convert it to a voltmeter. Okay, to convert it to a voltmeter, we introduce a RT. Okay, now what does a voltmeter measure? Voltmeter measures the voltage across two points in a circuit. Okay, I have this point and that point. I can measure the voltage between any two points. Okay, or across a say a resistor. Okay, now the important thing is the voltmeter should not draw so much current that you know it disturbs the whole circuit. That the current going in the circuit disturbs some stuff. So as a result, it is very carefully calibrated. To the, that's why they introduced this big RP. Okay? This RP will be very big. Okay? So as a result, the current through this RP will be very small. Okay? So now, okay? so as a result, what happens is I, so the current here, little bit goes to IG and much of it goes to the circuit element IC. Okay? Now the voltage across the circuit element equals IG times RG plus RT. Okay? Now we want IG to be 1 milliampere because that's what the circuit will support, right? And we, uh, and we want to be able to measure up to 10 volts, right? So at 10 volts, when it is calibrated for 10 volts, 
10 volts equals 1 milliampere times RP plus RG. RG is, is the fixed value. We calculate it with 20 ohms, right? And therefore, using that equation, you can then calculate V minus IG RG divided by IG equals RP. 9980 ohms, almost 10 kilo ohms. Okay, so big resistor is added in parallel. Hopefully, it doesn't disturb the circuit too much and it produces a, a deflection which is also at the same time uh, small. I don't know, they will talk about two stones. No, not two stones. Two mangoes with one stone. Okay. That, in a way, this is what it is. Okay. So, but you must know how to derive it and you must understand the concept. You understand the concept. You understand the uh, voltage and uh, current. Then it is pretty easy to solve these problems. Okay. But what you must do, and I'm telling you this, is you must solve some problems involving these things. There are different aspects in magnetostatistics. Okay. Now, uh, you know, a magnetostatics, many different aspects of magnetostatics where they, where they can test you and solve, uh, make you solve problems. So now, <clears throat> the B, we, we calculated the B, um, if, if there is a circular loop and there is a, uh, you know, a, lo a, a long line, the B at a distance Z from that circular loop using biot savartz law, right? DB equals ideal cross R by R cube. We use that to calculate the the um, the uh, the B, and we found that the B is along the Z direction. So if you have a loop, the B is along the Z direction, right? U naught I, uh, you know this this formula we calculate. Now, what happens when Z is far far larger than R, right? You can drop this down. Drop the a square plus B square, if B is very small compared to A, you can drop the B square, okay? So this will become just Z cube. So you will have U naught I square R square by 2 pi Z cube, or 2 Z cubed, okay? Now, he then introduced M as the area times the current, right? Remember, M is the area times the current. Okay, the area is 2 pi, uh, pi R square, right? So the area is pi r squared, so it is mu times mu by 2 pi z cubed times n. Okay, so he's relating it to the magnetic dipole. Now he is also deriving the case when you have a circular loop and a, the point is not, he previously we had a loop like this and there was a point here. Now he has a loop like this and he has a point here, okay? And he is using uh, a biot savartz law to calculate that, okay? That's all this mass. In this case, he has, instead of at a distance x, right? Previous case, we, we ended up with a 2 pi, mu naught m by 2 pi z cube. Now we are ending up with a mu naught m by 4 pi x cubed. If the loop is this way, it is 4 pi, okay? So now let's say you are making it spin, what will it be? It will vary between 1 by 2 pi to 1 by 4 pi of mu naught m by x cubed, okay? So now, <clears throat> what is the potential energy of a magnetic dipole placed in a magnetic field, okay? So the torque is m cross b, right? Tau d theta will give you the total between the uh, angles theta 1 and theta 2 will give you the total um, um, field. Now, mv sine theta d theta, right? mv sine theta, if you take the m and the b, you say that's constant, take it out and become sine theta, integral sine theta is cos theta or minus cos theta, right? Integral sine theta is minus cos theta and therefore you end up with cos theta 1 minus cos theta 2, he has introduced the negative uh, outside, so cos theta 2 minus cos theta 1, right? Minus is there and that's both, right? So now, uh, uh, the zero of potential energy, theta 1 equals uh, 
pi by 2. Okay. So for an angle theta orientation, you end up with u equals m dot b. What is the potential energy? It is m dot b. And it is same in the other case, it was p dot e. Right. So p cross e was the torque, p dot e we got. Right. Similarly, here also we have m dot b. And what is m? Remember, m is a times i. A pi r square is a area times i. Okay. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> Example, right? Radius 5 current i, right? B is 0.1. Right? He wants you to do m times b. What is m i times pi r square? Right? So he is asking you to calculate the potential energy. Okay. So now there are different types of magnetic material. I'll quickly go over this. Uh, you know, uh, now a diamagnetic element, right, is something which doesn't really have any magnetic uh, field. You know. So you, you, you can, uh, you know, uh, so according to Lenz law, the induced magnetic moments are dielectric uh, in opposite in the external to the external magnetic field, right? So diamagnetic fields have no intrinsic magnetic moments. Now they are independent of temperature. Now the second one is the paramagnetic, okay? Paramagnetic have a permanent magnetic moment, right? Okay. So in bulk matter, the individual dipoles are aligned randomly and, and hence magnetization is zero. Finally, there is the, so in such cases, you have something uh, which was discovered by the uh, husband of Mary Curie. He dealt with a lot of the magnetization. He introduced this term called psi. Okay, and so psi is uh, is specific to each of the materials. Okay, and therefore b is mu naught times one plus psi times h. Okay, now there is this uh, b is the magnetic field, but there is also this term h that was introduced, which includes the um, uh, you know, a different, uh, it's a different quantity from the regular magnetic field. Um, and so that is uh, different for uh, uh, um, uh, paramagnetic uh, magnetic material. Now, the final case is the ferromagnetic material. Ferromagnetic materials, they become uh, uh, magnetized, right? Uh, the atoms have an intricate magnetic dipole primarily due to electron spin. Okay? And therefore, uh, these are elements, uh, um, uh, you know, which are used in many different, uh, you know, every, you, you don't deal with um, uh, so much with permanent magnets, right? There is only so many permanent magnets, but these are uh, what are called magnets when, uh, when current is passed through that. Okay. So, for instance, iron is a ferromagnet. Okay. And uh, so, I, what I suggest is you uh, look this up in, uh, say, Wikipedia or read it in your textbook. Okay. Uh, what is a diamagnetic uh, material, paramagnetic material, and ferromagnetic material? Ferromagnetic material is, uh, you know, the, the common material that is very often used, like an iron core, etc., in uh, and which where you pass current through it and then it, it becomes magnetized. Okay? And so in the context of this, there is, they have what is called a hysteresis loop. And uh, when you traverse the, the thing with the hysteresis loop is like when you traverse the hysteresis loop, it doesn't come back to where it started. It starts at this point and then it goes through this kind of a loop. The B versus H in this formula, B equals mu naught times 1 plus psi M times H it traverses not a straightforward from point A to point B kind of thing, but it traverses a, a different kind of loop. Okay, So it starts from here uh, and then it goes through 
a loop. So B versus H goes through that. Now, if you had a ferromagnetic material, right, and then you wound it with a um, uh, a coil like this, right? This this kind of winding materials with a coil is called a solenoid or a uh, you know some other noid. You know this noid, that noid, and all that. Okay. So now this when you wind it, uh, it is it, it becomes what is called a solenoid. Okay. And when you wind it, uh, the uh, what you apply is this variant of uh, this. Uh, Ampere's law. Ampere's law is B dot dl equals mu naught i, right? So this one is H dot dl equals i. B by mu naught, right? B by mu naught is h, or B by mu naught times that one plus i n is h. Okay. So uh, so H dot dl equals i, right? And therefore h times all these two pi r times equals n times i. Okay. So the h is uh, uh, going to be um, um, uh, n times i. N is the number of uh, uh, coils you have made, right? Divided by two pi r, uh, you know. So uh, uh, you know, and, and basically this is another um, version of um, um, Ampere's law. Ampere's law is integral b dot dl equals mu mu naught i, right? Now h is B dot by mu naught, uh, uh, B is mu naught H, so H is B by mu naught, right? And therefore, you end up with uh, H equals Ni, H dot DL equals Ni, okay? And therefore, H equals Ni by 2 pi R, okay? So now, um, um, uh, you know, so with, with that, um, you know, we, uh, the important idea is that if you had a ferromagnetic material versus, you know, a, a, you know like a, a diamagnetic material and you wound the ferromagnetic material, you will produce much stronger magnetic fields because there will be internal currents inside that uh, ferromagnetic material. So that's why they use an iron core rather than use an air core. Okay. So, uh, uh, you know, so that is the important idea there. You must use ferromagnetic material uh, so with an iron core he ends up with 1.2 tesla but with an air core he just ends up with 10 to the power of minus 5 tesla okay so there is such a big difference between using an iron core and not using one okay now the earth itself is a magnetic field as you know this is how the compass works and it always points the compasses north always points to the Earth's magnetic north. Okay, so the arrow in the compass will point to the north magnetic north pole of the Earth. Magnetic north pole of the Earth has at times switched. Okay, uh, but most recently it has stayed the same, pretty much at the same place. It is not at the uh, in Antarctica, but it is a little bit. Slightly uh, angled from there uh, to at, uh, you know, I think 11 degrees, whatever is uh, is there in that picture. 11 degrees to the uh, the magnetic north is uh, is at an angle to the uh, geographic north. Okay, magnetic north is a few degrees away from the geogra uh, geographic north. Okay, now the angle between the geographic north and uh, the um, horizontal uh, component of the magnetic field that is called a like the declination. You know, New Delhi is at one degree seven inches of declination uh, from uh, with respect to the north and forty four degrees with respect to the east. Okay, so um, uh, so declination and inclination. Uh, now <clears throat> um, the next idea deals with uh, um, uh, magnetization. Um, so what I would suggest is, uh, you know, I thought I will be able to get through uh, this material completely, but, um, you know, instead of just running through all these slides, I will uh, stop here, um, uh, you know, because there is also the like Bohr's model, you know, 
Bohr's model is, uh, you know, you may have already heard about the four uh, uh, quantum numbers that Bohr has, right? So that, you know, that is next, you know, and then there is, uh, uh, you know, there is, uh, you know, S, P, D, and S, right? Um, and they are uh, related. One of them is also related to the, uh, one is related to the angular momentum, the other is related to the magnetic moment uh, in, in the context of the, uh, of the atom. Um, uh, I will skip through some of this material and now I will come back to this idea of the solenoid because we introduced this ferromagnetic material. Now, inside a solenoid, right, that is a, a piece of iron core with a with tightly wound um, um, a coil of uh, uh, current carrying um, uh, wire, right? Inside the solenoid, there is a there is a magnetic field, and the uh, size of that magnetic field is mu naught n times i. Okay, and the current uh, for unit length uh, is n times i. Okay? Now the 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 corresponding um, uh, magnetic moment m is related to the b using mu naught times n. T by mu naught equals n. Okay. So, um, uh, you know, and uh, so uh, h is equal to ni, right? Uh, we already discussed that. We, we discussed that earlier, right? h equals ni. Um, and, uh, you know, the uh, magnetization m, uh, you know, is related to, uh, you know, is Included in the formula for H, okay, and we will discuss that, uh, you know, uh, in the context of uh, Ampere's law. But I, I want to, uh, you know, kind of uh, quickly exit here because there is still too much material left, you know. So what I will suggest is that you spend a significant amount of time doing some problems involving. Um, um, uh, involving uh, torque and involving the galvanometer and then involving um, you know the magnetic field due to either biot savart's law as well as Ampere's law. Okay? We will revisit Ampere's law in the next class and we will do Ampere's law in the in the context of Ampere's law. We will look at various um, uh, questions, right? But please try to. Uh, do some problems involving some of the material that you've already learned, you know, uh, like I, I times L cross B and uh, parallel currents and, uh, uh, you know, Lorentz force and, uh, you know, maybe little bit Ampere's law, but we will come wind down Ampere's law next time, but definitely do Biot law uh, problems and understand that material well. Okay? So what I would suggest is you look at uh, your NCRT textbook and also try to get our app, you know, and in our app now we have this uh, assessment, uh, you know, uh, uh, external assessment. You can go there and do some problems also. Uh, we are also building a, a significant assessment module, which will be out uh, maybe next month or so. Uh, but uh, for now, please uh, solve some problems. Solve problems, you know. Only if you solve, we do so many examples in the class, but that, they are, that is mainly to illustrate the question. Illustrate the idea. When you solve the problems, you actually have to apply your understanding of the knowledge. Then you have to go back and read the textbook. And then you have to understand the solved problems in the textbook and the material well. Only then can you uh, do very well in, this, in the exams because these are difficult exams. And the aim of doing well in these exams, many people don't understand. The aim of doing well in these exams is to learn to learn. You are learning this material so that you learn to learn other things. Later on, you will learn other things. If you become a doctor, you have to learn Gray's Anatomy, Harrison, big, big textbooks you have to learn. So you learn to learn and you have to learn everything from cell biology all the way to uh, 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 you know, physiology. All the, so much material is there if you become a doctor. If you become an engineer, this material will come, come back and you have to learn this material only very well. If you become electrical engineer, you have to learn electricity and magnetism. No escaping it. Okay. So, but before all this, you must learn all this to, to pass the exam. Okay. 
So that's why I uh, 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 request all of you to download our app and at the same time also do problems uh, uh, so that you can succeed in, uh, in these exams. Okay, so um, all right, so uh, I will continue next class. Um, um, for now, if you had any questions, I can answer.